Hello, everybody. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming to join us. Uh, my name is Susan Bernofsky. I'm the director of LTAC, Literary Translation at Columbia here in the writing program in the School of the Arts. And you are at our, our semester's LTAC talk, a chance to hear from a particularly beloved practitioner of the art of literary translation. I'm so happy that we have Sawaka Nakayasu here to speak with us tonight. Um, she will be here talking in a moment um, and we will be joined also in the second half of, of the talk by my colleague Lynn Shu here from the writing program. Um, so we will have a bit of a, a three-way conversation afterwards. Um, before we get started, I would like to thank John McShane and Karis Wilson and Ali Jahangar who've been working to make this event possible for asking questions, which you can do at any time. Use the Q&A function and your questions will be relayed to me to be asked to, to our panelists. Um, and to our speaker. So the, the, the next introduction I'm going to make is to our introducer. Um, I am delighted to introduce Odelia Liu, who is a second year nonfiction student who loves poetry in the writing program. She's also the print translation editor for Columbia Journal, and she has very kindly agreed to introduce our guest speaker. Take it away, Odelia. Thank you so much, Susan, for the lovely intro. And I hope everyone is warm and cozy where they are. And thank you for coming to the event. And Sawaka Nakayasu, a poet and a translator of Japanese who has lived mostly in the US and Japan, is a brilliant writer whose works traverse genres, disciplines, and languages. Her books include Some Girls Walking to the Country They're From, Pink Waves, The Ants, the translation of the collected poems of Chika Sagawa, as well as Mouth Eats Color, Sagawa Chika translations, and her translations and originals. Reading Professor Nakayasu's works is an experience of immersion through the acuteness of her language as well as the strangeness of her images. They sometimes shed light on urgent discourses such as feminism, racism, immigration, integration, just to list a few. And they give you new insights every time you come back to them. Her experimentation subverts conventional forms, not only to convey the beauty of the original language, but also to communicate what it feels like to stand in the overlapped zone in between languages, cultures, and histories. What it means to physically embody the multi-layered and ever-shifting identities. Through her translations, she questions the concept of faithfulness while showcasing the multiple approaches through which a translation can stay fun and stay true. Her poetics are an act of resistance to literary conventions, to social, gender, and cultural norms. And they are also an embrace for collaboration and solidarity, a love letter to all of those who once felt alone. This is especially visible through the way Professor Nakayasu invites other artists into the dialogues, giving voice to the uniqueness of individual perspective, as well as the power lying in collective minds. All in all, she is an incredibly kind and generous human being who has inspired me in so many ways. And I hope you will find her works encouraging as well. It is my immense pleasure to welcome Professor Sawako Nakayasu. Hello. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you so much, Odelia, for that really, really nice introduction. And thank you um, to Columbia University. Thanks to Susan for the invitation to Lynn and John and Ali and Karis and everyone at Columbia whose work may or may not be visible to me tonight. Um, I'm going to get started in um, this conversation I'm hoping to have with you. Uh, the focus of it is on my desire to to, um, to think expansively about the field or genre or category of activity that we call translation. And I, I also at the same time want to mention 
that um, even as I'm advocating for different and unconventional or marginalized outsider, what have you modes of translation, it's also not a repudiation of conventional forms of translation, which I also participate in and enjoy and benefit from. So I'm, I'm wanting all of these things to coexist. Um, and although I have a lot of ideas around this, I'm also not advocating that anybody do what I do per se, um, although anyone is welcome to also, of course, to take any of these ideas and run with it. Um, I think part of it is that because my inclinations are primarily that of an artist, and that's the central node that connects everything that I do, which includes writing and translation and performance and teaching. Um, the thing that I think would be ideal is if every person develops their own relationship and their own mode of translation based on their own interests and proclivities and values and concerns. I'm interested in preserving the openness of art and in bringing translation closer to the realm of art rather than craft, for example, or worse, some kind of torturous, impossible hobby. <laughs> Maybe no one thinks of it that way, but I, I do feel um, anguish around translation that is sometimes inevitable and sometimes can be converted into something else. So I wanna bring translation into a space where art and art making is given the freedom to consider its forms and its practices. And in my case, to do that as freely as possible, as free um, as possible from unwanted external pressures, let's say. So developing one's own practice in art or in translation or in anything really involves a process of identifying and understanding what one's desires really are. And this is difficult because our desires are shaped and infected by the social and cultural spaces we inhabit and untangling that is a process in itself. So tonight I'm going to be reading from this pamphlet I recently published that's called Say Translation is Art. And I think of this text as something like a map that's charting the constellation of ideas that are feeding into my thoughts about translation and where I want translation to spread. And in our conversation tonight, I'll be sharing this text with you and then also adding um, what I think of as a series of annotations to those lines that I've written. And so here comes my share screen. So now you should be seeing this screen. Let me see. Okay. Say translation is art. Say this, say not this, say it again, like this. Say it again, say whatever it takes, whatever it brings, say this. I've often enjoyed the wildness of the range of improvisatory movement in sports. It's beautiful evidence of what the human mind and body can do in collaboration in real time within a fixed set of parameters, i.e. rules. On the other hand, in my life of engaging with sport, I've noticed that I'm often quite uninterested in the results, the winning versus the losing, even though I've thoroughly enjoyed watching the actions of people in the pursuit of winning. It's a framework that privileges process over product that applies to my thinking about translation. One manifestation of process-oriented translation, for example, might be the use of translation as a pedagogical tool, which has been articulated by people like Aron Aji, who runs the translation MFA program at Iowa. What you learn in the process of translation could even be more important than the output or the product of translation. A further extrapolation might lead us to imagine a world where everyone is a translator, 
Some people might have more or less or greater or lesser products in the outcome, but what if that process mattered more than the product? And if it was just something that everyone did, just another activity like brushing your teeth or going to the gym? Which reminds me of Kate Briggs and her discussion in her book, This Little Art, where she talks about dance class in relation to translation. Um, and let me remind you, by the way, that I am the farthest thing possible from a professional athlete, but I'm a very, very joyful amateur and appreciate a world where one can participate at whatever level without shame, a world where every home has a basketball hoop, a soccer ball, and a translation practice for the pleasure and interest of it. Say anti-translation as not refusing to translate, just refusing to translate, refusing to translate like this. Say it again. By refusal, I'm here refusing to adhere to conventional inherited definitions of translation. Refusal to translate can also be interpreted from an immigrant or otherwise othered perspective as a refusal to interpret, to explain, to make palatable and easy to consume. What results is an interest in simply being rather than being read, being consumed, being interpreted, even appreciated. That sometimes an exaggerated appreciation can also cause discomfort. Being can also replace representation. Refusal to translate as insistence on just being. Say translation of private space say public translation. I want to validate the activity that perhaps most likely many of us already partake in, which I'll call here a private translation. Laura Wetherington in her new book has called them reading translations. This act feels sympathetic to a kind of performance that I sometimes make, performances for an audience of one. So she's referring to reading translation as reading as an act of translation. On the other hand, the exploration of a public translation has some liberating potential too. For example, if I were to translate in some public and visible space, designating the actual live moment of translation as the thing that is shared, perhaps a mortifying idea to some, and yet the knowledge and understanding about this particular setup might lead to interestingly different decisions about what we prioritize, what we value, what we can and cannot do from within an unconventional set of parameters. In my own life, I also have an occasional practice of writing poetry in public. Say, I share this shape with you. Say, your shape is your shape, like this. This text arises from an invitation by Ugly Duckling Press, thank you, to write an expository essay on a topic of my choosing. I gave it an honest try, but my mind resisted the shape of the essay. I've always felt a resistance to forms, to being constrained. There are plenty of constraints on my lived life. I come to writing to be freed from it. This freedom I feel in writing is so insistent of force especially with regards to poetry, that I find myself caring little whether something is going to get published or not, is publishable or not. I noticed when I used to play a sport that I curiously did not care about whether my team won the game or not, except in cases where losing would mean no more games to play. Perhaps I cared more about the time of playing. Perhaps I care more about the act of writing and of translating. Perhaps my caring about my freedom is what brings me here in the first place. I suspect this is at least in part related to my attraction to the work of Chika Sagawa, who I translated. People often discuss her modernism, her melancholy, her visual collaging, but what I sensed most vividly and intuitively in her work is her freedom her complete ownership of the space of writing. I sensed that she was not answering to anyone but herself. This is why the book Mouth Eats Color, a book that bears the subtitle Sagawa Chika Translations, Anti-Translations and Original, Originals is special to me 
It's far from the official and conventionally legible and prize winning and generally accepted version of my translation of her work, which is called The Collected Poems of Chika Sagawa. But this Mouth Eats Color is my translation of the most inarticulate yet profound sense of the spirit and energy and open experimentation that I felt coming from her poems. Say non-binary stance towards text and translations. Say who you, say who I. Just um, stating some binaries here that are part of the conventional practice, source versus target text, author versus translator, moving the text towards the author versus moving it towards the reader, that's Schleier Schleiermacher. Foreignization versus domestication, that's Venuti. Here's one I like. Say feral translation. I've been thinking about feral versus domesticated animals and how feral has such a negative tinge and about our attraction and dependence on domesticated animals. But we exist among purportedly domesticated human animals that are capable of such an incredible range of cruel and horrific things we societally permit to happen. This is also a friendly jab at the old Schleiermacher continuum between the domesticating versus foreignizing. Oops, I made a mistake, that was Venuti. Um, anyway, bringing the text closer to the author or to the reader. Our metaphors reveal our values. If I introduce a new metaphor, I wonder then if this vector can help move us towards considering translation more prismatically and less linearly. Prismatic translation is the title of a collection of essays or papers edited by Matthew Reynolds in the UK where he suggests that we shift the central metaphor, what is commonly talked about as some kind of conduit or a channel or moving something from point A to point B and, and exchange that for a metaphor of a prism where we can consider refractions, multiplicities in various dimensions and intersections. Say, Eros in translation, say, I want to be translated by you, say, but not you, say, I want, I want, I want, I say. Desire haunts translation at every juncture, the sensation of reading a text and wanting to be closer to it via translation, to want to get inside, be with, inhabit a text. This is also why translators get possessive, I think, and feel something akin to ownership of the writer or the writer's work, which can get sticky very quickly. But in a more healthy relationship, erotic pleasure at the level of a word, a fragment, a line, something clicking into place. Say, translation, oceanic as desire. Say, wild caged animal longing to be free to translation. How can I achieve vastness in translation? How can I free translation? And how can translation free me? Say, I bend language translation. I love language translation. I stretch language translation. I break language translation. I have not ever met a translator who does not have some basic deep love of language. It is one of the elements that sustains the long task. Okay, I'm gonna skip a couple. Say what? is the largest unit of translation. Maybe I'll read the one before that too. Say, what is the smallest unit of translation? Say word, say syllable, say phoneme, say orthography, say handwriting, say breath, say the particle of thought preceding articulation. Say, 
What is the largest unit of translation? Say poem, say book, say all the books, say everything they ever wrote, say everything they never wrote, have yet to write, say the transit between everything they ever wrote and every one who ever reads anything they ever wrote, or say something larger, more vast. Let me try to go bigger than the single author model. I recently discovered that Jill Darling wrote an essay about poetry online during the time of COVID, where she discusses poems posted to the Haiku for a Global Pandemic Facebook group. And when I read her description of it and saw the group, I realized that this is the first translation of Haiku into English that has made any sense to me. And the reason why is because it translates the cultural and social way that haiku exists in Japan and has existed over all this time. Certainly haiku exists in multiple realms and is not limited to that particular kind of communal participation. But I wonder if we can't make more space for translation at this macro level. Say, what does queer liberation look like? if it chooses not gay marriage, but alternatives, alternative structures of human relationships, say instead of book into translated book, say book into alternative structures of literature via translation, alternative structures of literature via translation. The faithful translation has its parallels in mainstream American ideals about a faithful relationship and yet are people not capable of imagining new structures for relationships as well as new structures for translations? Harmony Holiday writes in discussing her book, Hollywood Forever, quote, discussing MLK's infidelity early in the book and in the bleak rhetoric of an autopsy was my route into dealing with how ridiculous our history of criminalizing and demonizing forms of love and affection that trouble the Western family structure really is. How complicit we've all become in our whitewashing by which I mean fear of telling ourselves the truth about ourselves. Say that other thing say ineffable, say possum, say tiger, say intergalactic creatures all afloat. Can't read it all of a sudden. <laughs> all afloat, I think. In the pre coe digitas, say this is how they translate. Say I you you me, I risk you me, say this and translate me. Thinking about my animal self allows me to ask, what kind of translation is the most accurate reflection of who I am as a living creature in the universe? Say, when Harriet Mullen reads from Muse and Drudge, the laughter dispersed to different moments in different parts of the audience translation. This seems a little bit like code switching, but I wonder if this effect of resonating with different people within the audience or speaking different translation languages within a single translation text can be intentionally cultivated in a translation. Okay, I'm gonna move forward a little bit. Say James Turrell's light into physical material translation. I'm getting expansive here. I'm thinking of a piece called Meeting in New York's PS1. The notion of a translation performed as a Quaker meeting. Everyone in a room, no agenda. People can just speak or translate whenever they want to. Or the notion of putting a frame around a piece of the sky. Can a translation consist of that action of framing pieces of a vastness, little squares in a vast text? Say Paul Preciado's Dildo Tectonics translation. Say Carolee Schneeman's meaty, joyful, vaginal translation. Say Jack Halberstam's Queer Art of Failure translation. Say Raul Zarita's Sky Below translation. Say Third Cinema translation. Third Cinema is a Latin American film movement from the 60s. 
it formulates itself like this, Hollywood being first cinema, and then non-Hollywood art films, mostly often from Europe, are second cinema. And then third cinema as a deployment of film being put towards the towards the active transformative and collective repositioning of artistic activity to serve the needs of social justice. Say, bad translation. I'm also thinking about Don Miche's discussion of failure in language. Quote, only much later I learned that cultural imperialism uses language to produce failure, inferiority. As a child from a neo-colony of the US, I had already failed even before I set foot onto the British colony. Unlike my father, I didn't know how to cheat my way out of translation. I could only mumble and sulk. Say misfit, unpopular, unloved translation. Ugly duckling press. Or I'm also thinking about the decision to choose who or what to translate is probably one of the largest translation decisions that a translator ever makes. And to take full account of the individuality of that decision is to gain independence as a translator. Just say no to CDLT translation. Standard, inferiori standard inferiorizing definition of literary translation. Translation. This, uh, this slightly awkward and derogatory term is coined by a theorist named Douglas Robinson. And he claims that the acceptance or standardization of this inferiorizing stance is used actually to justify the very existence of these inferior products or that the construct actually conditions translators to acknowledge defeat before even beginning. So if we shift the paradigm, according to Robinson, his ideal translator would be one who seeks to create not just an inferior imitation of a great text, but a great imitative text that is qualitatively different from its model. I kind of love the implication that you might actually actively choose a bad text or a not so great text to translate, but that's part of my interpretation of it. This is a view defined by a blurring of the lines between original texts and translated texts. He writes, quote, there are original works that are presented as and may be mistaken for translations. And there are translations that are so brilliant that they are mistaken for or recategorized as originals. In practice, the end quote. In practice, though, the predominance in cultural attachment to the seedult foreclose, forecloses on the true possibilities for this kind of excellent translation. On the other hand, putting that another way, this is what I was told in the only time I was ever formally taught to translate, which was in a workshop led by Keith Waldrop. And this is what he always said, make it better in translation. This statement is intriguing to me because of the different ways we can interpret better, which can lead to any number of potential outcomes. Okay, moving on say self-translation as eliminating the myth of the original. That's from Ryoko Sekiguchi. Say translating into a language, not your native language. Say committing error in translation. Say violating the integrity of that language. Say opening up the fissures where other things can seep through translation. Say blessed the CS is Cole Swenson, say blessed are the cracked for they let in the light translation. I believe that GM is Groucho Marx. Say let in the light, a different light translation. Say take space, make space translation. Say translation as breathing room. Say translation as breath. Say translation as extension of life. I'm also thinking of Raquel Salas Rivera's self-translations as answering to the specificities of their own bilingualism and its colonial roots. 
in this act, I see and feel a necessity to reframe the act of translation as arising from personal and global histories and thereby answering to a set of rules specific to that context. Say translation as process, say translation as pedagogy, say translation as pastime, translation as navel gazing, translation as close reading, translation as language study, as therapy, as training, mouthing, wearing, playing, running, jumping, skipping, translation as amateur sport, translation as playing in a field, as dancing at a club, that's from Latasha Nevada Diggs, as not sight but zone, Emily after, as porous fluid syntax, translation verbs over all, translation verbs over all over the place nouns. When I shift the emphasis from product to process, I'm shifting the emphasis from noun to verb. I'm also translating the practice of many other activities like running, dancing, learning, reading that we do without the same hangups we have about translating. Say translation as conversation, as friendship, as intimacy, Sophie Collins, as generous. Say counter translation as correspondence. Say subsisters translation, Oyana Wolf and Sophie Seda. Say translation in email, translation with parents, translation at the kitchen table, Madhu Kaza. Translation in the process of finding queer love and learning the language of a country, Lesotho, within another country, South Africa, and mourning the loss of friendship and love. Zara Patterson. Say remote translation, say close translation, say nomad translation, Pierre Joris. Say constantly in flux translation, say real time translation, say incomplete translation, say Translation in progress, say slow translation, say instant translation, say infinite duration translation, say mouth full of translation, body full of translation, translation in spite of and within the limitations of body, time, space. Say defund the police translation. Say divesting from racist brutality and investing in social services translation. Say priorities, preferences, customs, inclinations, values of importance and investment can shift because they need not stay the same in translation. This is a bit of a leap, but the notion of defunding the police last summer got me thinking about wider applications of this thinking that societally a certain amount of financial investment has been put into the police, the amount of money allocated for something as an expression of the importance we give it. I wondered if we could apply this thinking about divesting, in the case of translation, divesting from inherited values about what makes for a good translation, not because our radical translations are going to save Black people from police brutality, but because the practice of reconsidering inherited standards and translation is a practice and a training of the mind that can be part of the path towards transformative social engagement. I'm thinking through Augusto Bowles' Theater of the Oppressed, which Erica Hunt has transformed into a poetics of using poetry as a site of rehearsal for the world we want to inhabit. Say, the more time I spend writing and translating and making art, the more they all blend into each other. Say, the more time I spend being human and knowing and caring about other humans, the more the conventional structures of human relationships blend and regroup and reinvent those structures. Say, new structures of language articulated via the LGBTQIA plus community, opening the door to new formulations for structures of literature. Um, I want to quote Jackie Wong from her book, Carceral Capitalism. For some time, I've been thinking about how to convey the message of police and prison abolition to you. But I know that as a poet, it is not my job to win you over with a persuasive argument, but to impart to you a vibrational experience that is capable of awakening your desire for another world. Okay, just a couple more. Say translation is opportunity. This is a broad statement that can be interpreted in a number of ways. Taken out of context, I could be talking about the making of a literary career, the translator hitchhiking a glorious literary ride on the back of the translated work. 
This discussion about an opportunistic translation comes out of a history of colonial imperialist cultural takeover. But what I'm interested in rather is that because translation is so destructive, you take a text apart and then reconstructive to build it all over again, that it's opportunity to build back better or practice such, or at the very least build back different. Okay. Let me end with, where we go? Say distributed centrality translation that washes away the notion of the margin. This is from Lisa Samuels and her introduction to a Trans-Pacific Poetics. Her dismantling of the notion of the center undoes our assumption that those on the margins want to or are pointed towards or are moving towards an inevitable center. Her idea of distributed centrality allows us to imagine the center and margin dichotomy to wash away in a utopic revisionary landscape where individual localities and specificities can shape social and literary space. And I think I'll end there. Thanks everyone. Uh, I will stop sharing and we can all reconvene. Thank you so much, Sawako. I hope that everybody has now seen why it was that I was so glad that you accepted our invitation to come to come speak. You know, when I I teach translation here and you know, I'm from an older generation of translators vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, where my students are and the and the the practice that they as writers and translators are developing and I feel that the work that you are doing is really showing something about the field of translation growing and expanding and finding new intersections and, and relevance and every time I hear you speak I'm I'm kind of blown away because you make me think of things that are so obvious that I just I listen to you and think of course why didn't I think of it you know in in those terms um, so thank you very much for this really beautiful and enlightening set of ideas for us to talk and think about um, I have a lot of questions um, but I also want to want to start by looping Lynn in because you know your work is Sawako your work is well, I think many people who are here have 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 read your work, so already know. But you know, incredibly collaborative. You know, your your translations are, but you know, even your own books. Although I don't know the difference between an own book and a you know, I mean, one question I might ask is, what's the difference between writing and translation? Um, but you know, it's words with friends. There's you know, <laughs> lots of people writing together in in your work and together as you know, part of a process. Um, actually, that you know, there was a, Don Miche and and um, um, Jen Eliana Hoffer were were speaking together last night, and this came up as a topic: writing together mm. and as a process. So. I don't know, Lynn, would you talk a little bit to everyone who doesn't know about the history of your collaboration with Sawako and let's hear, you know, hear it from, from your both as point yeah. of view. I mean, I think, um, well, it, it's, it's one of the things that you talked about, right? Uh, translation is friendship, translation is conversation. So, um, and it's appropriate, I think, that we met at the Waldrop's house in 2006. And I remember, you know, I think that I re-remembered the, the meeting because you came in through the front door with this giant bag and it's just sort of this just sort of clanging, which I feel like I now re-remember as like hockey equipment, which clearly it's not, but I know how much you like hockey and I love that you talked about sports um, and I know that you played hockey while you were in Rhode Island. Um, 
but anyway, so then uh, we, I don't even remember what we talked about, but then we met again, I think a year later at an ugly duckling event at the kitchen 2007. Right. Yes. And then I think that maybe we decided to be friends. I can't be sure if that's true, but we moved <laughs> to Shanghai the year after that, right? We all, we both lived in Shanghai in 2008 uh, and to, to 2009. And I remember you know, we did, a, we did, we ate a lot of hot pot and we <laughs> did a lot of karaoke and we did these sort of very casual kind of strange translations of contemporary Chinese poetry with, with, and for Haiyan. Do you remember this? So, yes. so strange. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Um, and then, and then you went to Japan after that. And I, I went to the Bay area and, um, and many, many years later, Canarium, which is a press I, I co-edit, did the Chika Sagawa book, which you spent many years editing. I think that came out in 2000, uh, or working on translation. Oh, that, that came out in 2011. And so that- the, Is this a reprint? No, that's not the collected poems of Chika Sagawa. That's the Mouth Eats Color, which I love. That's the reprint. Okay, that's this the, is the reprint. Yeah. Yes, that's not by us. I that's couldn't the find the one that was by you. This is I'll the one that's out there. I'll give you a copy. We're not allowed to sell it anymore because of um, the reprint. Well, what's the difference uh, between the original the one and this one? Not much. Um, small press and big press. <gasps> um, big press eats small press? Mm. No, I think it was not that. I mean, we. what, what do you think? So I don't think it's big press eats small press. I think it was just um, where where I feel like the book, cause it's about lost classics, right? Lost voices, that yeah. series. Yeah. And so well, in my mind, when we decided to do this or a pass it on, I think is to get a wider audience, right? Is that, I mean, what yeah. do you think? No, it is. And it, it's been interesting in the sense that um, there's now this other generation of translations into other languages that are kind of percolating out of it, which was already happening before this edition anyway, but it's kind of, you know, it is a way for more people to know about it. Um, and it is something I was thinking about when I'm thinking about um, the translation, the choice of what to translate and how she was such a minor poet. She was hardly known and yeah. her whole, her whole, um, group of people were hardly known. And within that, she was even lesser known because she died young before the war. And so, so it's a, it's such a weird decision to choose something that is not already acknowledged in its home country as great. And, you know, and I, I see this so much where everybody's translating the greatest poet from this country and the greatest poet from this country. And it's not like that's wrong per se, but it's just not what I wanted to do. And I, I didn't know where I was going with it. I didn't know who would publish it. You know, I, it actually had a little bit of trouble finding a publisher. Um, and thank goodness. That, that, scenario. That's why we did it, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, think Lynn is my friend. So, you know, it's a little bit nepotistic. But I'm also interested, I've been thinking about that, that notion of um, friendship versus nepotism, which I think yeah. is kind of interesting because I used to feel very, very critical of it. Like, oh, people are just doing X, Y, and Z for their friends. I mean, there are aspects of that that is problematic. And yet there's a different aspect of translation where you can be prioritizing an actual relationship with friends over some other kind of market-driven and commercial motivation. So I, I found that other side of the coin, which I think is interesting. Yeah. I don't think you're subtracting opportunities from other people at the moment when you decide to write a poem together, you know? out of friendship and aesthetic, mm -hmm. aesthetic, you know, overlapping interests. No, I think Sawaka was talking about us publishing the Chika Sagawa Collected as like mm -hmm. a, a kind of conflict of perhaps, but I, I agree with you. I mean, I think that so much of, um, kind of the idea of collaboration or 
I mean, it, it, that's one of the questions I wanted to talk to you about is, is thinking about kind of kinship and language mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what kind of uh, forms of kind of language games and acts of kinship that are kind of, that, that get opened up or language that gets opened up in acts of kinship. And that sort of um, maybe will bring back, bring us back to sort of this new book um, that, that I, you invited me to be a part of, which I think that the invitation was very um, casual and natural. I mean, I don't think it was, it wasn't, you know, I guess formally one would say collaboration, but I think that it's it was rather just kind of natural. And I think that I'm trying to remember, and you just invited me and you said, well, translate something from there. I mean, it was like, that was, the, it was <laughs> as specific as it went. I mean, there was no like a piece I think you sent me a manus the manuscript and you said choose one thing to translate and the act of translation of what the concept of what, of what that meant remained absolutely open and I thought that was so beautiful in that um, thinking about kind of the way that that invitation is an invitation in itself to open up kind of the promiscuity the mouth uh, you know the plurality of um, of of the kinds of translations that are possible from these acts of friendship or kinship. Um, so anyway, I mean, I, I really wanted sort of to hear you kind of talk a little bit more about that. But, but I think that you kind of did in, in that refusal to translate being being, right? I mean, the, the sort of placing the emphasis on being rather than, um, rather than what it produces, but that sort of like, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of those things like, like the invitation and like the emphasis on being actually goes back to my background in performative arts where you know when I was when I was a college student when I was an undergrad I spent half my time playing floor hockey and the other half of my time um, doing modern dance and meanwhile the things I was studying was writing and music composition and in being in part of in that music program, I was studying music improvisation. So there's the improvisation of music and the improvisation of dance and the improvisation of hockey that I was spending so much of my time on during those years. And they've just left a mark on me. And so I've I've got a very deeply like like solid sense of improvisation as the thing. And the invitation to join in is part of that. Mm -hmm. There are um, there are a couple of translation pseudo translation poems in some girls walk into the country they're from that are like my attempt to translate and giving up halfway through. Not even halfway through. I I didn't even get very far at all. But but that became the thing. And so all these processes are the thing for me. And and then it's ironic because they get fixed in the form of a book. So they become product in spite of themselves. But then on, on the other hand, if I'm reading from that book, it kind of gets to live a different performative life and a different kind of improvisation around that. So it all comes back to that in a way. Yeah, which I think you showed with the, the lecture or the talk that you just gave that the annotations came in, right? I mean, that there is the text that is given, but then the annotations are you know, in real they are, well, and then, and then there's, there's that notion of performance and I didn't highlight this one, but um, I was really, I really love the work of Teching Shea and Linda Montano and the two of them being married to each other for a year by being tied by a three meter rope maybe it was three feet, which would be even more horrifying, but they spent a year tied to each other and that was their work. And, um, and both of them have done these kind of long-term durational performance, performance slash life things. And that, that speaks to me too. And so sometimes there's an aspect of being invited to give a talk and here's this event and yet there's something kind of performative about 
this duration of time that I have within the parameters of my own life. I have this much time to prepare for it. These are the parameters I'm working with. This is what I want to do, but I didn't, you know, I didn't manage to finish annotating all the pieces. And then out of the pieces that I annotated, I was then selecting from there into this moment. So it's kind of, those are some of the ways that it's interwoven. Are there other sorts of physical spaces that you would see as, you know, interesting, fruitful new places to translate into? I didn't understand that. Well, you know, you're, here's, here's a lecture sort of as a, as, a, as a translation and you're talking about physical, you mm -hmm. know, phys physical activity, you know, mm -hmm. are, there, are there ways of translating, you know, when you talked about a book into an alternate something, you know, mm -hmm. can that alternate something be something of physical in a physical space? Yeah, yeah. well, um... There was a period of time when I was making performances out of my book called Texture Notes, which is an older book. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I made a series of these where I would sit down next to somebody and we would select a poem. And then um, I would be in conversation with them while I sort of tore and cut apart pieces of that poem and collaged it with other things and created a oh I have a piece of that I think oh, yes yeah, yes I did one with you <laughs> yeah. yeah so I've, I've done that with Lynn but I also did it with a man next to me on the plane you know it's kind of um that was that was one thing I was doing um there's also from that book I did a series of one person performances so I would this was really fun I would I would I would um, ask somebody to give me a word and I would take the word they gave me and I would find a poem to merge with that word they gave me. And then I would, as I read that poem to them, I'm rewriting the poem with that new filter. And it's like a version that's specific to that person. Um, so yeah, so the texts become kind of these scores for improvised performance in you know whatever context I'm mm -hmm. doing at the moment. But I think that also brings me back to kinship, right? I mean, you're doing it with a man, you know, ne next to with a man sat next to you on the plane. But it's it's this improvisation that is the act of relationship, of re relating and being with. Mm -hmm. you know, another person's kind of language and being and time. But I think that you talk a lot about kind of inhabiting a kind of um, fixed duration. And that's that being kind of the set of parameters that um, where freedom can enter and, and be expressed. And I think that, yeah. Anyway. That's interesting how you framed that because the idea that, um, a containment of time can be a source of freedom that somehow by, and that's something I learned from, um, from dance improvisation too, that sometimes it's, it's the constraint that really creates something interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of really interesting questions are coming in from, from audience. I'd like to throw a couple of them into, into the, into the space here. Um, okay. One is um, saying, thank you so much for the talk. It was a dream. Could you talk about the morality in quote in scare quotes of the decision of choosing work to translate? You touched on that before, I think, but here's a second part. And on incorporating your citations the way you did in, in the um, say translation as an art, mm -hmm. which is a different sort of conversation, I guess. Mm -hmm. The morality of the decision of choosing work to translate. Um, does that mean that it would somehow be wrong to translate certain texts? I'm not sure if I understand the question. I'm, I'm guessing the ask, asker means more along the lines of what you spoke about before, you know, seeking out you know, work that was overlooked, for example, perhaps. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but is it but is it a moral choice? It's maybe that's not the word I would choose, but it's um it's an independent choice as opposed to a stance that is looking to represent something about a culture or a language that it's there are different ways of approaching that decision that would speak more to that particular community. So for example, um, when I was translating Chikasagawa, I got some I got some weird responses from Japanese people who were like, why? Why translate this minor poet? Why not so-and-so and so-and-so? And it, it seemed, it did seem incorrect because there is an assumption that the best and the greatest should be translated. And, um, and that I think is really an individual decision. Um, I don't feel, I don't feel critical. For example, like the most prominent translator of Japanese poetry that I knew of at the time I started was Hiroaki Sato, who is an incredibly prolific translator and has, you know, translated, all, and he's translated Chikasagawa too. But, um, but in general, I've noticed that he translates all the prize winners, all the major poets, all the people who are recognized by that community mm -hmm. as the best. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think I think one is better than the other. I just think that it, there's room for different ways mm -hmm. to go into it. And mm -hmm. there's, um, there's a beauty in the fact that this is not my paying job, that there's no, I don't owe anything to anybody. And so my decisions are really mine and they better be because they take up so much of my time and energy. It's, I, I can't possibly do this for something else that I don't care about as much. Mm -hmm. Another participant has asked if you could say a little more about what you meant when you spoke of anguish in connection mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. with the translation sphere. Um, I think there's a lot of potential anguish. Um, part of it can be that sensation of reading and understanding something in the original text and that, that process and desire of bringing it over to the new place and, and not quite able to bring everything you love about it or bring um, even something that you feel is essential about it is a really common feeling and it's something that I feel also um but there are lots of there are lots of things to anguish over you know we can just bemoan the fact that we can't do more or that we can't do all of it we can't bring over all the sounds and all the textures and all the layered and hidden and complicated meanings. It's infinite. That's also another reason actually why I did that Mouth Meets Color book is that one of the things that was really exciting about Chika Sagawa's book was her multilingualism. And I, I never found the right way for my translations to hold the multilingualism in the way that, that, um, that she was using it. And so as a response to that, I made an, an entirely separate book where I was kind of um, luxuriating in or expanding and spending more time with that thing that was lost in the other version. So in that sense, they complement each yeah. other. Yeah, you know, I, I have a question from, from, from a student who reads Japanese apropos of, of the Meiji restoration, the introduction of foreign elements into the Japanese language. And the question is, how do you retain the foreignness of katakana characters in your translation? The questioner adds, I'm thinking of promenade and how strong each syllable sounded in the original Japanese. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they are completely radical, weird, unfamiliar things that she was doing. And, um, and the fact that she, she was using French words in the Japanese and they were words that were not common in the lexicon. So they were just completely weird. Like she would, mm -hmm. there's one poem that says ventilator and 
you know, it, it sounds like I hear that. that word anymore. Well, yeah. And, like, <laughs> and it's like, this is, you know, this is part of our poem. And I, I did not, I did not preserve it in my official translations. I do not have that foreignness mm -hmm. and that's potentially a source of anguish, but on the other hand, it became something I wanted to explore further and bounce off of and respond to creatively and artistically. Um, what that means is that I guess I'm just not beating myself up over the fact that I can't bring everything over because the fact is it's a completely different thing. This here's a poem that was written entirely in Japanese. Here's a poem that's written entirely in English. Every single word is different. So the whole premise of translation is that it's a different thing. And I don't know, once you come around to that, it's a little bit liberating <laughs> to, um, to not feel so bound. And if you wanted to make the same thing, you would write it in that same language. Yeah. Yeah. Say it. Say it differently. Yeah. I'm laughing because I'm hearing make it better. But I'm like, <laughs> what is better? Okay, so what about gendered language? You know, mm -hmm. that 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 is different, you know, between languages. Mm -hmm. Um hindrance, limitation, opportunity. Anguish, joy. Mm -hmm. I can't answer that in a general sense because I think it's such a specific question. Well, I have a, I have a, this is from a student also okay. who says, think, you're going to have to pr forgive my pronunciation advance, please. Think Ohio go zaimasu versus Ohio. Okay. That's the difference between formal language and casual language, which um, also exists as a difference that cannot necessarily hold in English. Mm -hmm. But in, I, I, I can't, I still can't answer on a general level because one thing that we do as translators is that if there's something if there's something missing, if it's a level of formality and you know, okay, I can't bring the formality of Ohio gozaimasu into, or Ohio or that difference into the English, then I would be looking for it in some other place near that word mm -hmm. that would still have the larger effect. So it's not necessarily, oh, you know, it's not always one-to-one, -one, but it's, the larger whole to um, another whole, and that the pieces are reconfigured. Not everything is in the same exact shape, but you're yeah. trying to bring them over in its new context. Yeah. yeah. So when when you and Lynn are, are writing together, besides you know the French the friendship story, what does the what's the what does it look like practically? Is it sending drafts back and forth? Is it being in the same space? You know, how, how do you collaborate? So Waka just says, do it, and I do it. Send it to <laughs> wow. I mean, I mean, I think that that there is the other ones where um, where it was a translation, the sink or swim one with into the Chinese. And we did, uh, and that is sending it back and forth. But, you know, Sawako is very meticulous. I mean, she's just so meticulous. And um, and it's it's quite incredible because we have, you know, it's sort of just to try to kind of figure out a, a, a way of articulating a certain kind of precision um, interlingually, interlingually. Uh, and I think, yeah, it was, Anyway, but I want to talk about that poem because that poem originated when you and I, Lynn, were um, invited to read together at the museum. I and didn't know that until I read the notes. I didn't know that that, that was how. So funny. Yes, well, I didn't know, and I read the notes, and you you translated it into Chinese via the vocabulary in bilingual in the bilingual exhibition catalog. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Is, is someone going to read this poem? Well, I can't because it's not in a language I can read. It's Chinese. Uh, but I, I just want to tell the story. It's yeah, it's tell the story. Part of um, it's part of what I do, and it's that I was going to present at it was at the Guggenheim, so it felt like a big deal. 
and I was making this performance that was about a story. I was telling a story in it. And as part of the story, I wanted to translate this poem into Chinese, but I didn't really know how to translate into Chinese because I don't know Chinese. And I feel like I'm gonna get in trouble by somebody <laughs> telling this story. But I, um, I translated that poem by only using the bilingual catalog that was the art museum catalog um, that we were launching at this event we were in. And so, so I, was, I was going back and forth between the bilingual text and looking for the words in my poem in this catalog and I was using it as if it was a dictionary. So that was the limitation. And the other limitation was that I was working at the last minute and making this weird PowerPoint silent performance. And I didn't want to, I didn't think it was right of me to bother somebody to help me with the translation. And so I said, okay, I'm just gonna do this within whatever power I have. And what that meant was that it changed, I had to change the original poem so that it could fit this translation system I had made. And so that was, that was what I did. And then in the performance, I showed the process of changing the poem like one word at a time into Chinese. So that translation became the performance in, in that moment. And then in the book, it was kind of the next version of it where I did get help from Lynn because I felt like I could because there was more time and we're friends. So, so there's that. Yeah, I'm not gonna read it. You just look, it's, it's, it looks like this. I mean, it, you know, it's just in Chinese with a uh, girl F H I doing stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if anyone who hasn't read this book yet, you will find many marginal notes that talk about the collaborators who are, there are a number of, a number of collaborations. Yeah, which I thought, yeah. this is really interesting. I thought um, the, the sort of kind of um, the X, it, the, the small booklet, which is called, I guess it's, it's supposed to be kind of selected chronology and notes and which feel both extrinsic and intrinsic to the text and also just sort of becomes an archive of encounter. So it really just seems like the, the, the act of collaboration, writing is that act of collaboration and conversation. And it really is an invitation to kind of inhabit that space of encounter and to open that up again, if you really wanted to, right? Um, as the reader to sort of kind of have re-encounter in, in a variety of ways. And I feel like the Chika Sagawa, I mean, it, it feels like a different iteration of the, um, of the Mouth Eats Color because when I read that book, that book is incredible. I, it's one of my favorite books that I just recommend all the time or teach if possible, uh, because I feel like what happens is like Lydia Liu's translingual practice, right? It makes translation into a translingual practice and you can feel like doors between the language swing open and I think that that moment of like the door swinging open feels that is an act of freedom like with you create these acts of freedom within the kind of language itself um the encounters so I thought that I mean I think that book is just incredible me too and it's published by Rogue Factorial which I I wondered if you wanted to talk about kind of publishing it right because you talk about uh, creating books that are not necessarily uh, products in the marketplace, necessarily mm -hmm. in the literary marketplace. And to think about kind of that act of self-publishing, I think that's the only yeah. that's the only one that you did. Uh, I wonder if you wanted to I say- did do one other book on that um, imprint, if you will. But I was thinking about translation, not translation, about publishing, and I was feeling really fed up with it. Yeah. Um, I was living in Japan and it was right at this moment where there's this weird um, to do over a press called Blazebox, Blazebox. Mm -hmm. And somebody who had had their work um, uh, 
slated to be published by Blaze Vox got very upset when the publisher is a small press, the very small press, and the publisher asked the writer to chip in a little bit to help pay for the printing. And that person felt very upset and betrayed by it. And it became a whole to do. Meanwhile, as this is happening in the US, I'm living in Japan among Japanese poets who are reporting to me that they paid of their own money, they paid the equivalent of $50,000 to get their book published and that it was normal. And I, I kept asking other people and it was, you, it was the cost of a new car as far as I'm concerned. And I, I was so astonished and the books are very, very high quality, mm -hmm. hardcover, you know, intense production. But, but that just blew my mind. And I'm looking at these two extremes and going, I don't want to participate in either. So I want to do this myself. And I'm also doing this in a month of time because I was feeling, well, I was, I had had my first child, so I'm a mom. I also got this very intense teaching job where I was teaching eight classes a week. So full-time, full-time work plus this brand new baby, plus I'm clueless as a mom. And so it was a very, very stressful time in my life. But this one month opened up where I had daycare and no classes. And I said, for this month, I'm going to perform being a writer. And that was the, that was the constraint. And I said, I'm making this book in a month. Fuck y'all. <laughs> <just, laughs> and, and that was... That was what produced all the, the weirdness and all the, um, the sort of irreverence and um, openness and experiment and process mm -hmm. and everything is in that book and everything you know, that I was feeling about so many things, about translation, about publishing, about poetry, about um, life, all went into that book. And, and I had to publish it by myself because who, what publisher was going to do that within the month for me? Because when that month ended, it was like Cinderella and I had to go back to work. <laughs> so, so yeah, that, that book in a way feels more like a, a performance than, oh, well, actually that's not true. I have a couple of books that are performances. I have one book that I wrote on Thanksgiving day in 2017 when I just moved back to the States and I couldn't stand the thought of doing Thanksgiving. I didn't have my family near me. People were inviting me to their Thanksgiving dinners, but I felt so conflicted about everything that I said no to Thanksgiving and rode the bus all day long and wrote this book. And I think it's a terrible book because nobody wants to publish it, not even my friends. But, <laughs> but that book is really important to me as a performance. And it's a document of that more so than it is this beautiful literary artifact. But, um, but that kind of marks my end of Thanksgiving, which is nice. I feel free from whatever pressures they had ever exerted on me. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there were a world where people would be willing to pay as much for an excellent book of poetry as they do for a car? How yeah. would, that, would, you know, right. what would, that would be an interesting economy I'd like to see. Um, maybe next year. Um, I've got a bunch of questions that are coming in. I, let me ask another question from the audience. What is the role of repetition in your work? Asks another writer translator. Does it function as insistence, as variation, emphasis? Mm -hmm. Anything else? All of those things. Um, also love. Also, um, presence, and also a reflection of life, which is full of repetition. Um, also, that uh, the Japanese tea ceremony is has this kind of slogan, if you will, that's called Ichigo Ichie, and it means one one chance, one meeting is kind of a rough translation of it. And that notion that the whole ceremony is completely repetitive. You do the same exact things in the same exact way, but 
within that repetition, each iteration of it with that person in that moment is different. So repetition is really beautiful. I mean, we listen to our favorite songs all the time. We reread our favorite poems all the time. How many times do we read something when we translate? <laughs> Translation is perhaps the most repetitive thing ever. Yeah, it's true. I never thought about that as repetitive reading, but really absorption of the text. Yeah. You know, the, the, all the says, you know, when say translation is art. Um, so I'm reading it as an imperative. Um, to who is it, to whom is it being said? Who's saying it? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, to myself and to you. Um, I'm not sure how, well, I think that, I think that does have a specific audience. You're right. Because I'm saying something, um, I'm speaking into a field that's, that's kind of very interesting in the way that it's grown so much in the last couple of decades. I remember when I first started translating, which is around 2000, 2001, it was really a very minor thing to do. It, was, it didn't have a lot of attention. It didn't have people clamoring to be translators. I don't know how many people are clamoring for it now. I hope there are more, but I think that it's, it's grown and grown. And I think there's room to consider it in other ways. And so, so it's, it's a friendly call out to anyone who's interested. Do you think of the book as a manifesto? Um, I may have at some point. I can't remember if I said that. I feel like I said it's a treatise, but um, I do think it's a. I do think it's manifesto-like. Um, sure. <laughs> Here's a, here's, a, here's a question from a writer translator. How might a translator find the courage to translate into a non-native language, commit error, or even violate the integrity of that language if that translation will be read? I know, that's dangerous. And people might hate you for what you do. <laughs> um, so you have to be convinced, like you have to really want to do it or believe it's important for you to do it and be willing to willing to deal with the consequences, whatever they may be. And, you know, and I would say that it's important to be aware of power and language. We talk about that a lot in terms of translation and some languages can be more powerful than other languages. And, and you have to be have some clarity, at least internally to yourself of what your relationship and position within those languages and cultures might be and, and what, what error might be. And, you know, and I think, I think that's a really relevant question. And I, I might mention too, that as I was doing that, that weird translation um, in Chinese using that art catalog, I was, doing that in the context of being a little bit critical of myself for being in this event itself, which was to celebrate an opening of, um, of Chinese artists at the Guggenheim. And so I, I felt a little bit funky about the fact that I'm Japanese in this Chinese context. And so I was being um, kind of overly self-aware and, mm -hmm. um, Kind of mocking myself in that process in that process perhaps you know when you're talking about and, I, and this is to speak to the student question too that that particular worry seems to be one where the 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 work would become public right i mean what if you if what if we go back to what you were talking about kind of be having the emphasis on process mm -hmm. and what you learn 
I mean, if that becomes a practice in which you translate from other languages, but just to learn what mm-hmm. you can from that encounter, I mean, I think that that you can think of it very, very differently, right? I mean, I don't think that those, and and you can learn what that responsibility can look like um, through repetition and through these re- kind of re-encounters. I think that that's true. I think that that could be a possibility of, you know, but I think that the responsibility of representation, right? That that kind of being the person who represents the person, the the text, or I mean, that that seems to be the the uh the problem that you're kind of addressing or ask yeah anyway yeah and i think that it's there's a lot of pressure when you're translating out of a minority language Mm -hmm. and um you can't avoid that pressure of representation yeah if if this is the only thing coming out of that language then you can't prevent um everybody else from interpreting it a certain way Um, so yeah, I don't I don't have an answer for that, but I think that I think that it's um it is something we can think through and with and in in dialogue with the various um involved parties or with you know even in dialogue with yourself about whether this is something to publish or not or what context. And I'll say too as an example of that Um, There's a Korean poet, a Korean modernist poet named Yi Sang, and his poetry is completely incredible. And I I encountered this work when I was in Japan. A Korean Japanese poet invited me to translate a specific poem for a specific purpose, and I did it. And I really love the work, but I did feel uncomfortable about the fact that he wrote his earliest poems in Japanese because of the Japanese occupation and because everybody in Korea was forced to learn Japanese. And so so that relationship is inherently part of the work. And my position as a child of Japanese imperialism, I feel, I felt uncomfortable and I felt, and I still feel a certain tension that never really goes away but it was only when I got invited to participate in that book that you just held up Susan where it's mostly his poems and writings from Korean into English and I was able to contribute a selection of Japanese poems into English Mm -hmm. as part of that context but it's a context that really shows him for who he is and in his um, identity as a Korean with this aspect of Japanese language. So that made it okay for me, but I think I was not comfortable um, charging forth with my translations of Yi Song's poetry, even though I thought it was one of the most interesting um, groups of poems written out of that modernist avant-garde yeah. Japanese context. These poems are so awesome. I'm just, I, they're, thank wild. you. I, the book is amazing. They're, they're yeah, amazing poems. Know. Yeah, Um, but English is, you know, no less problematic as a, you know, as a language with a really, really messy historical legacy that, you know, it's hard to, hard to, you know, separate our translation practice from, um, and so I'm so grateful to, every writer translator out there who is looking to create a writing translation practice that embraces the multiplicity of Englishes that are out there, but the multiplicity of Englishes is a a direct consequence of, you know, colonial military imperialist history. And, you know, so the work that we write and the work that we translate cannot help but participate in this in this legacy because these are the words that we have and we you know we don't have words not touched by this or maybe there there are surely languages not touched by this but not languages available to me personally and yeah anyways 
I think about this translating from German to English, you know, it's two, two languages with complicated cultural histories also, but, you know, I guess one didn't directly colonize the other, but, you know, it's plenty messy all the same, you know. And yet um, the wonderful literature you've brought into our landscape is, you know, it's not something we want to do without either. And mm -hmm. so I, and so I think what that gives us is practice in holding these um, disparate feelings, these disparate um, stances that are not, they're not clean, but they don't, you know, they don't resolve easily. And yet they're still valued that we value enough to keep going. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's still joy and dance and, you know, movement within, within the spaces these languages create. I think maybe like for me, that is where the value is, right? In the sort of complexity of historical encounter. I mean, across the languages, I feel like the baggage they bring and the sort of um, is, is actually kind of made up more apparent in these encounters mm -hmm. and therefore actually complicate those conversations and, and allow us to have these conversations. So I think that that's, you know, that's a part of the multiplicity of, of creating kind of different historical trajectories for different kind of texts um, and to, to sort of awaken them again. Uh, you know, and I think that that is actually where it is, is, is where it's so like fraught, you know? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for that. Thank you that for that also, you know. Um, we have to draw to the end of our conversation. And I, in a way, I can't think of a better topic for us to leave it on because I feel we've sort of like zoomed out, you know, after, after talking about the poems on a, a, a more local level, kind of zoomed out to a, mm -hmm. to, to a, bigger, a bigger picture. Is there, is there gonna be, um, is there gonna be some, um, I don't know, space travel translation? Sawako, can we, <laughs> can we, can we, can we, can we take it up? Can we go up from here? Where are we going? Oh, that's so funny because I've just been thinking about big history and the ways in which there's, there's just a little bit more of a movement towards studying history on that cosmic scale. And I was just thinking with my two kids about the, the, the concept of before the Big Bang and before the space time existed. And like, and to think about what we do in relation to that is a little bit too much and more than I can handle right now. But I do think there's value in scaling in and out of things. And that when mm -hmm. we do scale it out, we can see things in a very different way. And so I, I would like to go there. I, I don't, um, I don't currently have a practice of that, but I'm willing to work on it. I feel certain that if somebody figures out a way to give you a three day deadline for it, it'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> if only we're so easy. <laughs> uh, thank you so much though. For I, oh, so Susan, I just want to say how much of an honor it is to be in conversation with you and, you know, as someone I respect so much for your work as a translator, but also as an advocate of translation and as someone who has been such a big part of growing the field, which is, you know, really, really deep and rich and lively and engaging. So thank you. Well, I thank you because I feel like, you know, I've, you know, as somebody who started translating in the 80s, I'm ready to see, you know, where the field is going. And I feel that, you know, I'm looking for inspiration from, for translators who are, who are moving forward of where I see my own practice. And you are absolutely one of those key people for me. So your, your work inspires me so much and I am learning from it and so grateful to you. And I'm so happy that I can, you know, I'm working with student writer translators and I'm so excited that they can, you know, learn from you as well. 
So thank, thank you, you so, so much. Thank you. Such, such a joy, a joy to see you also. Yeah, likewise. Just seeing your face. And Lynn, we, Lynn and I, you know, we're at the same institution and don't yeah, really we see our faces. Uh, well, it's nice to see you too, Lynn. Thank you. You're so welcome. So, and thank you to, to everybody who came in the audience and asked questions. Um, I think we're, we're closing down now, but you know, everybody have a, have a wonderful night and, and go get all of Sawako's books and read them and Lynn's too. And Susan's, I mean, you know, I, you probably already have them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good night, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Bye.